Father, I pray for our friends, our families, for those, Lord Jesus, that are literally scattered abroad or at home today, that your spirit would rest upon them, that your love would overshadow them, that they would know that you literally are caring for them. Holy Spirit, walk into their atmosphere, walk into their room, come join them even in their car if they're sitting there listening to a podcast and let them sense the presence of God. Love them, love them. Just pour your love out upon them, I pray in Jesus' name. For those, Lord Jesus, that have lost loved ones, we pray that you would encourage them. Give them an eternal perspective. Help them to see that heaven is real, that this earth and earthly time is just temporal, but eternity lasts forever and ever and ever. So, Father God, today we fix our eyes on you and we say thank you, Jesus, because you're a good God. You love us. Amen. Turn over to the book of Acts, chapter 1. The Bible says that Jesus came and he was eating with the disciples. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if you've thought about it very much, but here's Jesus in his resurrected, glorified body, but he's able to come and literally sit down and partake of a meal in a meal with the disciples. That's pretty awesome. I don't know what your glorified, my glorified body is going to exactly look like, but I assume that it's going to be a lot like the glorified body that Jesus had. He could move, you know, at the speed of, I say, thought. Not light, not sound, but thought. He was just there, and then he was gone. He could come, and he could walk with the disciples down the road of Emmaus and carry on a conversation, and they didn't even know who he was until they sensed that their hearts were burning with them. And when he began to break bread with them, again sitting at a meal, they saw that in the breaking of bread, that it was the Lord. I don't know if they saw the nail prints in his hands. I don't know if they just sensed that they'd been there before, that it was the same Lord. He was exactly the same presence as when he broke bread with them before in the upper room. But they said, didn't our hearts burn within us because Jesus was there? Well, Jesus has come to fellowship with the disciples one more time. This is at the end of the 40 days, just before the ascension. So we're in the book of Acts chapter 1, and in verse 8, Jesus gave them a promise. He gave them some revelation that was going to be a life-changing. They would never be the same once they grabbed hold of this particular thought and revelation. He said, but you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost come upon you, and you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to all the ends of the earth. And after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes in a cloud, and a cloud hid him from their sight. So here was Jesus on one of the very last times that they were to see him, and he gives them this exciting news. You're going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when you do, your lives are going to be changed and transformed. When the Holy Spirit comes and gets involved in your life and in my life, our lives are transformed and changed forever, church. That's what you've got to grab hold of. That's what you've got to understand. If your life hasn't been changed, if you're not in a, in a transformation process, then you need to get down and do exactly what the disciples did, and you need to pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come and overshadow you once again. Now, this fledgling group of prayer warriors, the Bible says there were about 120 in number. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there with Jesus, and they didn't have a clue what to expect. They had heard Jesus say, that he was going to send the promise of the Holy Spirit. But they didn't know what that was going to look like, sound like. They didn't know what it was going to feel like. They had no expectation. They couldn't put their heads around it. But they knew 
that Jesus had given them a living word. And he said, now I want you to tarry. I want you to wait in Jerusalem until it comes. And so that's exactly what they did. They went back into Jerusalem, back into the upper room, the same upper room where Jesus had had the last supper with them and where he had broken bread with them. And they went back into that upper room and the Bible says that there were 120 people and they began to do what Jesus said to do. They prayed, they prayed. I wanna give you a word this morning. When in doubt, do what Jesus said to do, pray. Just pray. Now, he said when the Holy Spirit comes, something is gonna happen. He said you're going to be endued with power from on high. You're going to be endued with a supernatural presence. And this presence is going to make you contagious. I like the idea of using the word contagious because everybody is so sensitized to this word. They're afraid that their neighbor might be contagious. They're afraid that the boss might be contagious. They're not sure if the bus driver is contagious. But God wants the church to be contagious. Contagious of his love, contagious of his anointing, of his grace and his mercy. Where else can the world find mercy? Where else should the world find grace if it isn't in the church? And so Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills you and falls upon you, you're going to become contagious and infectious. And your church, your people that are of the church, you're going to literally go out and turn your neighborhood upside down. Upside down. These disciples went hither, thither, and yon. They went out into the highways. They went down into the streets and up the avenues. And when they went, they continually talked about Jesus. And the Bible says they turned their then known world upside down. A group of people so passionate about Jesus that they're contagious. That's my prayer, that the church of Jesus Christ will be so in love with Jesus, so passionate about Jesus, that you will be contagious. People will just see you. They'll experience something emanating from you. The Bible says that you're a sweet-smelling savor. In another scripture, it says that you're like a letter read of all men. When they see you in the store, when they see you in the neighborhood, they should be able to read the love of Jesus all over you. Amen? That's what happens when the Holy Ghost comes and these people become contagious with the love of God. The other day, I received a phone call. I didn't know who it was. The fellow on the other end of the line said, you don't know me. You won't remember me. I don't know if you ever met me. But he said, I'm phoning to just give a praise report and to say thank you to the individuals that helped me on my journey of faith. So I said, well, tell me more. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Why are you phoning? What happened? And he said, a number of years ago, he said, in fact, it's probably over 40 years ago. He said, I was a young man. And he said, I had a friend that came to People's Church. And that young man lived in what was called a boy's house. Back in the day, we had a number of houses, and the young men lived in, in a house, and the young ladies would live in a different house, and we had, you know, probably over 20 of these houses scattered throughout the city, and so he ended up going home with his friend from high school and just hanging out, just being there for a few days. He said, um, I watched them. He said, I observed them. He said, I saw them pray. I saw them share the Bible with one another. I, I, I saw them laugh and eat together. And he said, I was curious, but he said, I didn't repent. He said, I, I, was, I was hungry, but I wasn't sure that this was for me. So he said, I went home. I went back down east. I think it was probably Cape Britain. He said, I went back east. And he said, I, my heart just kept churning within me just kept churning within me until he said, as I, I sense this hunger growing, this curiosity growing, this inquisitiveness growing, he said, I realized that my friend and his buddies had something that I didn't have. Those young men were contagious. Those young men 
were infectious. And he said, I want to know if you know the phone number of my friends so that I can phone them up and say thank you. Thank you. Because I've been serving Jesus all these years. And it was a result of being amongst those young men that were in love with Jesus. The church needs to be cont contagious. The church needs to be infectious. When people come around you, when they talk to you on the street, when they come into your home, are you going to have enough of the presence of God burning in your life that you're going to infect them with the joy of Jesus? Amen? I remember walking into the sanctuary once a number of years ago, <clears throat> and um, I came across a very curious sight. There in the altar area was a young man and a whole group of young women sitting around him. I guess that's what sort of caught my attention. One man, six or seven girls, sitting on the floor in the middle of the day at the altar. And I crept in quietly. They didn't notice me because they were engaged in a Bible study and conversation. So I sat down and I just listened and observed. <laughs> and to my sort of chagrin, and to my amazement, I realized that this young man was talking to these gals about the Holy Ghost. But he was way over his head. <laughs> he really didn't know what he was talking about. He was trying to share with them the importance of the Holy Spirit and how to receive the Holy Spirit. But he didn't really know what he was talking about. And so at an appropriate time, I just sort of went up and joined the circle and sat on the floor with them. And we picked up the conversation and kept talking. And you know what happened that particular day? God filled him with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and God filled those young ladies with the Holy Spirit in the middle of the afternoon. Why? Because they wanted more than they had. They wanted to become contagious. And this young man, in his, in his um, love for Jesus, had literally become infectious. And these people were looking to him for some information. And he was willing to jump into the deep end and give him the very best that he had, even though he wasn't exactly on target. But man, he was shooting. And I want to encourage you to get into the presence of God and just love him and pray in and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and to fill you with overflowing so that what you have to offer is going to be something that somebody else needs. And so they got the Holy Ghost. And their lives were never the same from that day on. Here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said to the disciples, when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you'll be witnesses. You'll be witnesses. Now this is one of the last things that Jesus said to the disciples before he was ascended and he was caught up into the air and the cloud hid him from the disciples. And so Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem, wait in Jerusalem, pray in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And when you do, something's going to happen in your life. You're going to become a witness. You're going to become a witness. Sometimes we Pentecostals like to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that we talk in tongues and we pray in the Spirit. I want to tell you that there's another very important evidence that whether or not you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is whether or not you're sharing your faith, whether you're witnessing, whether you're out there telling somebody about Jesus and maybe even in over your head and talking about spiritual things that you haven't even experienced yet, but you know them to be true because you've read about them in the Bible. And so you're going to share that good news with whoever you can. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're going to be a witness. You're going to be sharing your faith and you're going to be telling them that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And so in other words, we learn to live on the edge. We learn to get out of our comfort zone. We learn that, that there's more to life than just going to work and coming home and going to work and coming home. The real reason that you and I are still here is to not only worship God, 
but to invite others to become worshipers as well, to invite others to come and experience the peace of God. You know, Jesus used persecution to fulfill this promise. When you think of it, he said, first of all, you're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, <clears throat> then in Samaria, and then in Judea, and then in the uttermost parts of the world. Well, when you read the book of Acts, you discover that the disciples quickly became comfortable in their atmosphere. The Holy Ghost was moving. Miracles were happening. People were getting healed. Church was growing. People were being added to the church daily, such as should be saved. They had sweet fellowship. They went door to door. They, they broke bread with each other. They relished in the word of God. They studied and they prayed. But they weren't getting very far away from ground zero. They had sort of gotten stuck there in Jerusalem. And so God used a very uncomfortable experience to send them out and to get them moving. Have you ever thought about that? The church has often found itself in uncomfortable situations. We find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation today where due to restrictions, the doors are closed, the numbers are limited. You know, the programs that we once pro, uh, prided ourselves on and we put so much effort into, those programs have all but shut down and we aren't functioning the same way that we've functioned for years and years, maybe hundreds of years if you want to say that, or even centuries. And all of a sudden, the church finds itself in a brand new, uncharted waters in a brand new experience wondering, how in the world are we supposed to communicate this? I really think that God wants us to wake up and realize that just like the early church had to get out of Jerusalem and get out into Ju Samaria and Judea and the uttermost parts of the world, maybe God's just trying to shake us up and get us moving again so that we're not afraid to let the world know that we serve a God who loves us and who is with us and who is, you know, overshadowing us. And we're just not in the four walls of a building looking at each other and rehearsing our stories with each other. Instead of just talking about fishing, we actually have to go out and fish now. Instead of just talking Bible scriptures together in a Bible study, we actually get to go out now and share the Bible with others. We get to do what we've been taught to do for the last umpteen years. We get to practice what we've been practicing. We've been praying. We've been seeking God. We've been saying, God, we believe you. We believe you. believe you. Well, now is your opportunity to really practice what you've been believing for and you've been praying for for a long, long time. So God said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're not going to be static. You're not going to be self-centered. You're not just going to be, you know, staying in one little place and just talking to the same people over and over and over again. You're going to have to be contagious and get out into the world and let the world know that Jesus Christ loves you with an everlasting love. I remember... <clears throat> a couple of young fellas, it was Dan and Don, and uh, they had gone to get involved in a ministry known as YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And they had gone down into Ontario and they had ministered that summer with Youth with a Mission and uh, been out on the streets witnessing and sharing the gospel. And the summer was over and they were in their car, literally headed back to Edmonton when they spotted a hitchhiker, a young lady on the side of the road. And so they stopped to give her a ride. They picked her up. And, you know, to their, uh, I guess, amusement and maybe even excitement, they discovered that she was actually an Edmontonian. <laughs> and she had been out hitchhiking around the country all summer trying to find meaning to life, trying to find a purpose to live. Well, you know what happened to that conversation. It quickly turned from looking for the meaning of life, looking for purpose to Jesus Christ is your purpose. Jesus Christ 
has a purpose for you. And to make a long story short, they led her to the Lord there in the car. She went her separate way to find her, gather her belongings and head back to Edmonton. And they kept on their journey. And lo and behold, it wasn't very much, very long uh, afterwards that she showed up at church. She got baptized in water. She started to grow in her faith. And soon she was leading one of those houses that I talked about earlier. From there, she became a Bible study leader and got married to a young man that also had a vision to serve God with all of his heart. And then from there, they went out and they went into the ministry and they are still actively involved pastoring a church. But it all started because there was a couple of young men that were contagious, infectious, and they shared their faith and they brought her to the place where she surrendered her life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's what this is all about. The anointing of the Holy Spirit isn't just to give you goosebumps on your goosebumps. The anointing of the Holy Spirit isn't just to make you happy or make you feel good. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is to empower you to share your faith with whoever and whenever you have the opportunity. Amen? And so share your faith. At our anniversary a number of years ago, I invited a young man to come and share his story with us. And Jay came and shared his story. It's an amazing story. A young man that, you know, had a very exciting career. He was a skateboarder. And he was actually, if I, my memory serves me correctly, the, the, the American champion in skateboarding. So you know he had to be good. But in that rise... And in that fame, he got off track. And he ended up in a horrible state. He ended up on, on drugs and substance abuse. And his life went from being at the top to being down in the gutters at the very bottom. And he told his story how that one day he was sitting on the side of the road on a rainy afternoon, hopeless, didn't have a clue what was going to happen to his life or with him. Ready to give up. Ready to just throw in the towel. But God. Everybody say, but God. But God had an individual driving down that very road that rainy afternoon that was living on the edge, that had a contagious faith. And as he went driving by, Jay, who was sitting there on the curb, not even with his thumb out, but just sitting there forlorn and hopeless, this businessman went driving down the street and all of a sudden he sensed something in his heart. He sensed that still small voice saying, you've got to stop and you've got to pick that young man up. Well, by that point, he was already down the street. But he sensed this still small voice saying, you've got to talk to him. And so he did what any Holy Ghost man would do, I hope. He found an ex exit and he turned around. And you know, when you're on those California uh, freeways, you can sometimes drive for miles before there's an exit. And then you've got to turn around and go the other direction miles again before you can get back. But that's exactly what he did. And I don't know how big the freeway was and how fast the cars were moving. But you know, he did exactly that and he exited he got turned around, he made the whole loop, and the second time when he came by, this young man, Jay, was still sitting there, hopeless and forlorn. And so by the time he found a safe place to park, he walked back in the rain in his suit jacket, and he knelt down beside Jay, literally put his arms around him, and said, you need help. He took Jay home with him, and started to Share the love of Jesus with them. Share the power of God to change with them. And that young man, Jay, surrendered his heart to Jesus. And today he's pastoring a very successful church in California. Why? Because there was a man full of the Holy Ghost, full of the contagious faith that wasn't afraid to stop on a busy street, busy road, whatever it was, and get out in the rain and put his arms around a young man and say, you need help, and love him back 
to sanity and faith and hope. God wants the church to become alive. He wants the church to be active and, and, and vibrant and out there willing to share their faith. He wants us to be living on the edge. Living on the edge means that we're going to jump for every opportunity. Living on the edge which means we're going to tell others about Jesus Christ every chance we get. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, you're telling stories from bygone years and bygone days. I want to tell you that people are still living on the edge. This weekend, Glenn and Irene are down in another province ministering and singing and sharing the word of the Lord. Amen? Next week, Tessie is going to be down in Dallas, Texas, and she's going to be sharing the word of the Lord and ministering to a women's conference, living on the edge, believing God for the impossible. I know that Ian has his opportunities to go in to the, the jails and the remand center and share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know many of you are out there on the buses, in the parks, in the, in the stores, in your backyards, sharing your faith about the Lord Jesus Christ, living on the edge. This is the day, this is the hour that we need to rise up because people feel that they can't come to church. You know, they sometimes don't feel that they're going to be welcome at the church. I was out witnessing, we were going door to door, just out the door here and down the street, probably not a block away. And I knocked on the door, or rang the doorbell, whatever. And this individual came and we gave them an invitation to come and join us and to come and worship with us. And they looked at us with this sort of shocked expression. You mean we could actually come to that church? I said, well, of course, the doors are open. Everybody's welcome. They said, well, I don't know what denomination it is. And I'm sure I wasn't raised in that particular denomination. I said, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what denomination you were raised in. It doesn't matter if you ever went to church before in your life, but you're welcome to come. And you see, just because we feel at home, just because we feel welcome to come, doesn't mean that everybody else feels welcome to come. You've got to give people opportunities opportunities to come. People willing to live on the edge. People with a contagious faith that say, here I am. I've got something to infect you with. And they're going to let you sense the love of Jesus burning in their hearts. And so the Holy Ghost empowers us, empowers us to go, to shout it from the rooftop, or maybe in this day and age, to shout it from social media platforms. Pick your choice. Take your, take your pick and, and get on there and start letting people know that you're praying for them, that you're loving them, that you're willing to talk to them. And so the early church was scattered because of the persecution. And they went everywhere. People just, that's how the gospel was spread all over the, the then known world. You know, we, we don't read the story or the testimony of everybody, but we do read the story of some. Philip went down to Samaria. He got out of Jerusalem. He got out to Samaria. And there he started to preach. And the Bible said because of his testimony and because of his witness, the whole community turned to Jesus. Can you get that? They got baptized. There was miracles. People were healed. Hallelujah. Who was Philip? He was just one of us. He was just a, a servant of God. He was a disciple, as we say. He wasn't an appointed apostle. He had never been to theological school. He had never graduated from seminary. He was a disciple in love with Jesus, so full of God that when he went out and started to share his faith, people responded, and the whole neighborhood, the whole community got saved and came to the Lord. There was such an excitement in that community. They sent back to Jerusalem, and Peter and John came down and prayed with them, and they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Things just kept growing and growing and growing. And from Samaria, they went to Antioch. And from Antioch, <clears throat> they ultimately went all over the world. Amen? Paul got as far as Rome, down into Caesar's palace. And you say, how did that happen? Well, if you remember the story, when Paul went to Rome, he was a prisoner of Caesar. And he was in the dungeon in Rome. But in that dungeon, he had interaction 
with the guards and with the soldiers. He had interaction with other people. And people would come and go, come and go. And he wrote back to the church and he said, listen, I want you to know that the gospel of Jesus Christ has penetrated. It's been so contagious that it's even got in amongst Caesar's household. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes you put yourself down. Sometimes you underestimate the power of your witness, the importance of your story. Sometimes you think, well, who am I? What do I really have to say? Listen, you've got a story to tell. You've got a message to share. Jesus Christ has saved you from a life of sin. Maybe it was rebellion. Maybe you were, you were hung up and, 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 and uh, uh, a slave to, uh, to substances and other th evil things. But today you're free. And you're a servant of God. You're a child of the Most High. You've got a story to tell. And don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. But make sure you do it. I'm talking to people today. And I know that some of you watching are looking for answers. Some of you are lonely. Some of you are afraid. You've watched too many news broadcasts. You're afraid that the next variant, the next virus is going to be the last one. It's going to be the super strong one. It's going to just wipe out everybody. I'm here to tell you some good news, some good news. Now, before I tell you the real good news, I'm going to tell you some more bad news. And you've got to hang into this. You've got to understand it. But the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Think of it. You and me, all of our friends, We've all been exactly the same in the same situation. We've been sinners separated from God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then there's another verse of scripture that says, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Can you imagine that? People die. People are dying. And they're dying not just because of COVID. The Bible says that we are dying because the wages of sin is death. We all die because we've all sinned. And some of us are going to die of one sickness or another sickness or one situation or another situation. But we all die because of sin. But the good news is that God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you, to die on the cross for me. And if we'll acknowledge that, the Bible says if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ not only died, but that he was buried and he went into the grave and he rose again from the dead. The Bible says if you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, you will be saved. You can be saved today. Your life can be transformed and changed forever and a day. I want to pray with you and I want you to pray with me. And we're going to ask Jesus Christ to take over, to take charge, and to dispense some forgiveness to us today. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to pray and ask Jesus Christ to make you a new person, a new creature, and give you a new purpose for living? I'm going to ask those that are here in the auditorium to stand. I'm going to ask you to pray out loud with me because we want those that are watching to feel that they can pray this prayer as well and that when they pray it and when they ask, God's going to hear them and God's going to give them a miracle. And so would you pray out loud with me right now? Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize today that I'm separated from you, that I've been lost, that I've been living in sin and rebellion. My life has been one of disobedience, but I believe that you can forgive me. I believe that you will forgive me. Cleanse me from my sin. Adopt me into the family of God. Cause me to be one of the chosen. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I submit to the Father. I say, be my God. I want to be your child right now. Amen. Amen. I want you to know that God heard that prayer. He always hears it. When an individual cries out to him, 
He always hears that prayer. I want you to find yourself a good church. You can come and join us at People's Church, 156 41 96 Avenue. And we're here to help you grow in your faith. Touch base with us. Go on the webpage. Give us some information about yourself and let us pray with you. And we're going to believe God that in the days that lie ahead, your life is going to be contagious for Jesus.